So then we're going to be looking at biotechnology. So first of all, what is biotechnology? So biotechnology is the manipulation of biological systems to create products. Basically, this means that you are playing around with life and inventing new things from it. And usually the organisms we're going to be dealing with in bio- Do we have a gem kit today? Oh yeah, we are at the end. But the slides do not say so. Then wait. Yeah. It's the hoot time. Oh, never mind. Okay. I think I was not having a brain moment, but we're going to be doing a game at the end because my Kahoot runs weirdly on my computer and there's always lack. Okay. Anyway, so biotechnology is usually produced to create um, antibiotics, hormones, pesticides. Also, if you know anyone with diabetes, um, they need excess insulin, and that is also a product of biotechnology dealing with bacteria. Um, there are four main areas of biotechnology. So our focus, since this is a genetics class, we're going to be looking at the medical approaches and uses for biotechnology. And this involves creating vaccines, insulin, like I mentioned before, growth hormone, which some people um, have dwarfism, meaning they can't grow tall because they lack a human growth hormone and biotechnology is used to help them grow tall. Diagnosing disease, say, yeah, diagnosing diseases. I feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong. Okay, but yeah. Um, and gene therapy, which we will look at. Also, the other, the second area is industrial. So, for example, you're using organisms and biological enzymes to create paper, pulps, fabrics, um, et cetera. For food, if you guys are probably really familiar with genetic, genetically modified organisms, and that's why we have like huge corn that's so much bigger than it was 100 years ago because of GMO, wheat, rice, and it's how we feed the world. Another area, the final area is environmental, and this mostly encompasses bioremediation, which is using biological systems to help the environment. So, for example, a while ago, there was an oil spill by a really big company, and it was a really big oil spill, and the way that they fixed that was actually introducing oil-eating bacteria into uh, the ocean where the oil was spilled. And that's an example of using biotechnology to fix the environment. I believe so, Richard. So Richard said, was it the deep water horizon? I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. So don't take my word on it. But um, the bottom right, I guess, infographic, these are a list of commonly genetically modified organisms, and it involves pretty common crops that we use every day. So biotechnology and medicine. So biotechnology is what it's used to prevent, diagnose, and treat illnesses. And as you know, that's really important because one of the, I guess, biggest technological advancements of the human population is medicine. So it improves medicine because it provides advantages and pieces of evidence or knowledge. So it helps scientists discover new things that lead them to make better medicine. So for example, the genetic composition of the human species. If we understand the actual genes of a human, we can help target diseases and mutations. It also helps see how genes are passed down from generation to generation, and it can help predict whether a child will have that disease. So for example, uh, Down syndrome, I believe, would be an example of something that scientists have come to be able to predict because of biotechnology. Also, we can repair DNA actually with biotechnology. So. There are multiple, I guess, subfields of medical biotechnology, genomics dealing with genes, pharmaceuticals dealing with 
pills, pharmacy things, medication, yeah. DNA sequencing, another part of genomics that is more specific. Cell culture, which is making new cells in the lab. So for example, if you're making the growth hormone to help short people grow taller, that's an example of culturing growth hormone containing cells. Interference RNA, which is a method of trying to suppress genes to not express a disease. And of course, the genome, which is also more general. So there are many different methods of actually approaching biotechnology, including gene sequencing, which we will look at. We'll look at all of these later. Tissue engineering, repairing and introducing new cells to tissues, antibiotics, and stem cells. So it usually involves altering DNA, RNA, whole tissues, plasmids, which I will explain later, and also totipotent cells. So stem cells are either totipotent or pluripotent cells. And this means that they have the ability to turn into any kind of cell in the body. So different types of cells would include blood cells, skin cells. They have, stem cells have the potential to turn into any kind of cell. And in the bottom left um, corner is an example of cell culture, as you can see, you have, first you have one cell, but then in the lab you grow more cell and eventually you can get a whole product. Yeah, okay, so Vedant just asked, aren't they in the mother's umbi um, umbilical cord? I think that's how you pronounce it. But yeah, so when we are in our very early stages are early embryo stem cells are pretty much essential because you need like you need skin blood bones you need all these different kind of cells so you can actually become a human so in the embryo you'll find a lot of stem cells that have the potential to turn into any of these components necessary so yeah um there that's not the only place that stem cells are and we will look at that later. So this is a brief history of biotechnology in medicine. I will just go through the key ones. So actually, I'm not even gonna like go through this. I'm just gonna- Wait, You should just ask us to read it. I should ask you guys to read it. Yeah, just like read it to ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm going to do. I'll stay on this page for like a few tens okay. of seconds. I don't know. And okay, I sent the link in the chat. So if you guys want to look at this more in depth, you can. Oh, I did submit. You can look at that. But yeah, this is a brief timeline. We're going to be talking about the key, the key different wins for medical biotechnology in the later side. So this is just like a very brief overview. Wait like one more minute. Okay, and then I'm just gonna go. All right. Okay, so the first, okay, so I actually messed up because I was planning, I was planning next week's, um, next week's lesson, like yesterday, and I made that, pet, I made that question, what time do you shower? I thought I made it this week. So next week, I'll make the question. What is your pet peeve? So that's my bad. Um, anyway, so our first, I guess, area of interest is going to be recombinant DNA. And this is a very important part of biotechnology because there are a lot of potentials and different combinations that can result from using recombinant DNA. 
The recombinant DNA is DNA made from two or more hosts. So for example, if we have a bacteria gene and then a host human cell or something. And then so recombinant DNA can be made in three ways. So the first way is transformation. You select the DNA you want, you cut it using restri restriction enzymes which clip DNA. So you have like a section of DNA that you want, that's your gene, and then so the restriction enzymes act as scissors and take out that DNA. And then you put it into a vector, which is just anything that can help you transport your DNA. So it can be a plasmid, which is a circular bacterial extra-chromosomal DNA. So basically, it's just extra DNA that's in the shape of a circle, I guess. Um, so then you insert a selectable marker that allows scientists to see if the host cell actually takes up the vector. So a selectable marker is basically anything that lets you know of the existence of a gene. So for example, antibiotic resistance. If the host cell develops antibiotic resistance, then you know that your transformation worked. Also, GFP is green fluorescent protein, which allows a cell to glow. It's found in jellyfish and the discoverer of it won the Nobel Prize, I believe. So if you have a cell that doesn't glow, but then you transform it and it glows, you know it worked. Non-bacterial transformation is just transformation, but without a bacteria host. So like a virus. And then phage induction. So phage or bacterial phage or bacteriophage. I don't know. It's used instead of bacteria. So a bacteriophage is basically a virus that attacks bacteria. And instead, you don't use a vector, you use in vitro packaging, which is something that I'm not going to go into, but um, viruses use it instead of bacteria. And you have lots of combinations or lots of applications. So the whole point of recombinant DNA is to introduce a gene that can provide your host with some kind of advantage. So for example, if you have um, wheat, in a really dry savanna, it's gonna easily catch on fire. So if you introduce a heat resistant gene to wheat, then you have better crops. And the same logic can be applied to all of these things that I listed. If anything doesn't make sense at any point in time, just tell me and I will slow down or answer any questions. So gel electro- so How do you add heat resistance to that? Yeah. Okay, so that's a very good question. So um, you guys know Yellowstone and how there are like thermal vents, which are like really underground, like holes with sulfur and steam just being out of them. So some bacteria live in those vents and those vents are like really, really hot. So for the bacteria they, to live, they have to be able to withstand the heat. But we can actually, yeah, they do. Sulfur, 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 rotten egg. I don't like the smell of that. But basically, if you take one of those bacteria from those really hot vents that's resistant to heat, and you extract the gene that causes them to be heat resistant and put it into another organism, then that organism ends up developing the heat resistance if the transformation is successful. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So moving on to gel electrophoresis. So gel electrophoresis is another very important idea in genetics and biotechnology. It separates biomolecules, DNA, RNA, and protein based on their size. So first you have to get all of the 
Yeah, but Don just said that word is the epitome of mispronunciation. Electrophoresis. Yeah, okay. Um, anyways, so molecules are pushed by an electric field that is made of gel with small pores in it. So the electric field runs from positive to negative, and DNA and RNA are both negative. So you start them on the negative side, and then it starts to gradually pull towards the positive side, and then the proteins are coated with this chemical solution, which causes their structure to not fold and turn back into like a line and makes them negative. I think that part got kept cut out by the image, but yeah, it makes them negative. So they also go from negative to positive. And the smaller the molecule, the faster and further it travels. So this is just a diagram that basically shows um, what's happening. So as you can see, the largest molecules stay behind and the smallest ones travel further. So this has many different applications. And so one application for gel electrophoresis is blotting. So blotting is used to identify specific biomolecules in a mixture. Again, we are dealing with DNA, RNA, and protein. So a particular type of molecule is extracted and treated to be run through the field. So this molecule is just DNA, RNA, or protein. So it will be treated in different ways depending on what it is. So for proteins, they're denatured. That means their structure is broken down back into amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. And then the disulfide bridges, which also help proteins maintain their structure, are also broken down. And nucleic acids, they have restriction enzymes cutting their genes for the importance. So all of this, after it's being treated, is then run through a gel, electro, electro, gel electrophoresis. And after that, it's transferred into a membrane sheet. And the negative molecules will actually get trapped in the sheet. So... And then we're also going to be using selectable markers. Again, it's just something to let you know that the molecules are actually there. And so we can visualize them that way. So there are many different types, types of blotting. You don't need to memorize all of them, obviously, but just remember that Northern usually deals with RNA, Southern usually deals with DNA, Eastern usually deals with post-translational modifications. So after protein is made and Western deals with protein. So sequencing, this is probably the biggest part of genetics and biotechnology where they intersect. Sequencing is determining the order of a nucleotide sequence. So your DNA is made out of different nucleotides, A, G, P, C, and the order of that we can find through sequencing. And it's useful for identifying mutations. So for example, if you have one nucleotide that's not supposed to be there, if you know the, what the nucleotide sequence should be, it's really easy to see the odd one out. Diagnosing disease, again, those arise from mutations and also helping treating it because you can actually go to the place where the mutation happened and fix that sequence using other biotechnology. So the first genome completely sequenced of a organism is the Haemophilus influenzae, and this was sequenced in 1995. So this is a prokaryote. Um, yeah, so, wait, wait. Um, all right. I'm going to talk about the Human Genome Project, although it's not on there, it was on the timeline. So the Human Genome Project was actually founded in 1990, wait, I'm gonna go back. Okay, 1990, wait, I'm gonna stay on this. 1990, the Human Genome Project was launched. And so this project aimed to sequence the entire human genome so basically all of the genes on its chromosomes. And this project took a long time. It took 
13 years for the entire human genome to be sequenced. And that's because Sanger sequencing was used. Sanger sequencing is a type of sequencing that is useful towards nine towards DNA that is 900 base pairs or less. So it's not meant to sequence a genome as huge as the human genome, but it was what was available at the time. And the problem, the steps are first, the DNA is denatured, and then all of these factors are added. The temperature is then raised, and the DNA polymerase adds complementary no nucleotides to the DNA, which is so you know how a DNA is usually like a ladder? Denaturing only keeps one side of the ladder while the other is chopped off. And then in step two, DNA polymerase adds back that second side. And so this creates a lot of strands, which can be separated again using gel electrophoresis. So another kind of sequencing, or I guess a general term for DNA sequencing is now is next generation sequencing. And this is a broad term for all sequencing that is lower cost, more efficient, cheaper, has smaller reactions, and can sequence a lot more base pairs at once. So it's much more efficient than Sager sequencing because it's new and it's more developed. So some examples of next generation sequencing include RNA sequencing, which is used to reveal how much RNA is in a sample, also, um, analyzing RNA in different conditions. So for example, um, with this kind of gene, without this kind of gene, and also post-translational, post-transcriptional modifications. So what actually happens between DNA and protein. Also, transposon sequencing, which is currently limited to bacteria, it determines gene interactions and mutation frequency. So mutation frequency is basically how likely you are to get a disease because mutations give rise to disease. And if you guys don't know what transposons are, that's perfectly normal. I still have a very um, blank idea, but transposons are basically jumping genes because they can go, they can just like move around in the genome and insert them anywhere. So 51% of our genes are actually transposons. So transposons, basically, they don't mess up gene sequence, but they can give rise to mutations because they interrupt nucleotide sequence wherever they are. What you see on the right is an example of Sanger sequencing. And this is how different nucleotides are determined. As you can see, everything in column four is the nucleotide, nucleotide T. Everything in column three is the nucleotide A, and so on. So PCR. PCR is another huge breakthrough for biotechnology in dealing with genetics. So PCR allows one copy of DNA to be copied billions of times in a super short amount of time. And it's also called molecular photocopying for that very reason. The inventor was credited for a Nobel Prize because of this breakthrough. And so the first step of PCR is denaturation. It's when DNA is broken down into two strands. Annihilation, that's when uh, DNA synthesis starts. And elongation, it's when actually the two pieces of DNA turn into, or the two strands of DNA turn into two complete strand, new strands of DNA. And so the DNA polymerase that does that is TAC polymerase. And this is a bacteria from a thermal vent in Yellowstone. This is because PCR requires really high temperatures to operate. And so normal DNA polymerase can't withstand that. But TAC DNA polymerase, can withstand that, which is why it is used. So TAC is actually a type of bacteria. So again, we are using bio, we're using organisms for our own benefit. And so it was what valuable. Stand for? Um, that is a good question, actually. I should probably memorize this, but let me search it up. 
Oh, oh my god. Okay, I'm having a complete brain fart. It is polymerase chain reaction. It's a chain reaction because you go from one to two to four to eight, and then it just keeps on doubling really, really fast. So that's why it's called a chain reaction. And polymerase, because um, polymerase is the enzyme that actually adds the nucleotides. As I'm having a brain fart. Um, this is really valuable because it sped things up a lot in the Human Genome Project. It's also used in DNA fingerprinting, which I believe we'll look at next, and also detecting bacteria and viruses, diagnosing genetic disorders. So DNA fingerprinting. So first, to understand DNA fingerprinting, we need to know what many satellites are. So Actually, 99.9% .9 of all human DNA is the same, but that 0.1, a lot of it is many satellites. Many satellites are short pieces of DNA that vary a lot more than the usual genome from person to person. So even though we are 99.9% .9 the same in terms of DNA, that proportion doesn't hold true for many satellites, and they vary a lot. So. DNA fingerprinting is basically detecting the different mini satellites and people and creating a unique pattern out of them, which is why it's a fingerprint because no two people have the same DNA fingerprint unless they are identical twins. Then the probability is much higher. So the process, the steps for DNA fingerprinting are first the DNA is cut using scissor enzymes. So they cut the DNA, it's run through a gel electrophoresis, it's separated, then it's blotted out, remember blotting, into a membrane, and then it's unzipped to form one DNA strand. And then so the probes, so probes are the same thing as selectable markers, so things that just indicate the presence of a gene, that's a probe and a selectable marker. Um, they attach to the mini satellites, and then they are exposed to an X-ray, which shows the fingerprint thanks to the probe. And this is super useful for forensics, because when a tiny bit of DNA may be left behind in the crime scene, that's enough to figure out who it is. So it's also useful to find out a child's real parent by matching it. So as you can see on the right, at the crime scene, the DNA left behind, it can be from an actual fingerprint or something, but this is the DNA fingerprinted um, result. And then if you have all of these suspects and you all take DNA fingerprints for them, we see that suspect two's DNA fingerprint matches perfectly with the one found at the crime scene. So we know that suspect two did it. So stem cell research. Stem cell research is my absolute favorite kind of Wait, part. didn't Dolly the sheep like not live as long as a regular sheep? So yeah, that is a good point I will address when we get there. So first we need to understand what stem cells are. Stem cells are cells that have the potential to differentiate the any cell type. We already talked about this. They are podipotent, which means that they can turn into any cell type, and they most commonly come from embryos. But also, adult bone marrow cells, they have something called hepa... Wait, okay. It starts with an H. Oh my god. Okay, I'm blinking. But HSC is the abbreviation, I believe. And those are also... Um, stem cells found in bone marrow, they turn into either white blood cells or red blood cells. They have that potential, and pluripotent cells can actually be turned back into totipotent cells. So um, totipotent cells have the um, capabilities of turning back into a new embryo. Pluripotent cells don't have that ability, but they can differentiate into any other cell type. Um, so the uses for stem cell research, we can use it to see how diseases form. We can also use it for regenerative medicine and testing the safety of new medicine by seeing how the stem cells react. So regenerative medicine is basically you replace damaged tissue with cultured stem cells. 
And this is used when organ trans in organ transplant because usually organs are really limited. And so by using stem cells, we eliminate the need for a healthy organ and also worrying about like if the organ matches or not. Um, therapeutic cloning. So another name for this is somatic cell nuclear transfer. And this is when genes are removed from an unfertilized egg. And then, so basically the nucleus is removed, but then it's injected into an unfertilized egg. So the only thing, so, okay, so a fertilized egg consists of an egg cell and a sperm nucleus. But if an egg doesn't have that sperm nucleus and we give it a new nucleus, then it becomes fertilized and it develops as it was. So Dolly the sheep, so basically the results of somatic cell nuclear transfer is clones. And Dolly the sheep was the first ever organism to have successfully been cloned. And so I do believe that she didn't um, live as long as, um, I guess, normal sheep. But I think the focus was more on that, like, she actually matured to a point where it was, it could be counted as an actual clone. So this showed that the potential, there was a lot of potential to not only clone, but we could also use this to bring back extinct organisms. In Jurassic Park, I'm sure you've all heard of that or watched that. Um, scientists used DNA trapped in amber of dinosaurs to revive dinosaurs. And while this may be fiction, scientists have actually used this to bring back more recently extinct organisms. The Piberian Ibex was the first organism to be successfully actually brought back for ex from extinction for 10 minutes. So there's a lot of potential with this, but, but I only guess, 10 minutes. Yeah, it's actually very sad, but it just shows that it is possible because like the organism was extinct, but we brought it back. Even if it was a short amount of time, this shows a lot of potential to revive biodiversity. Um, I don't think cloning dinosaurs would be a good idea though. Uh, it's also not possible in humans yet. So what is gene therapy? Gene therapy is introducing patients to cure a certain disease. So it's highly controversial because it's very dangerous and it's only tested on disease that have no cure, like cystic fibrosis, cancer, and AIDS. So um, you can either add a gene or edit an existing gene. So we can either suppress a problematic gene or replace mutated genes. Uh, the species that was brought back for 10 minutes is the Piberian Ibex. I can... I don't know if I'm spelling that correct. Or was it Pyrenean Ibex? Wait, okay. But yeah, it's like a goat, a mountain goat. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so gene therapy is literally messing with someone's genes, and that's why it's really controversial. And a diagram of it is in the left. Also, I forgot to mention this. The picture on the right is Dolly and Dolly the sheep. Or Dolly the sheep and Dolly the sheep. All right, CRISPR, very notorious. Um, so it stands for Cluster Regularly Interspace Short Palodromic Repeats. And it is a bacterial defense system that can be used to target and edit genes. It's typically associated with gene therapy because you're editing genes. Um, and it can, it can also target RNA and diagnose diseases as well. And the whole process is just basically you have CRISPR, it turns into RNA, it binds to a protein called Cas9, which searches for complementary DNA and it cuts it and disables it. So in this whole process, the Cas9 protein can also carry a gene that's functional. And so the gene that is essentially replaced. So that is what is in the bottom, All right. So the whole thing is called CRISPR-Cas9 and it's just basically gene editing. And so finally, last slide, we have what are the ethical concerns? 
So obviously a lot of experiments on live organisms is debated because it's very dangerous. So you don't know what's going to happen. And there are a lot of side effects, especially to gene therapy. If you mess up someone's genes, you can actually like give rise to new diseases that weren't there before. And so patients should have the treat freedom to determine their own treatment, even if it's not a disease that can be cured. And should we also really go against nature and alter our bodies? Um, some controversial topics, including life extension gene therapy and uh, principles that are considered justice, benefits, utility, autonomy, and veracity. I'm not going to go deep into those. Well, Vedant, Vedant asks, why would we need to replicate our bodies? Sometimes people just do things for the sake of science. Technically, we don't need to understand everything, but humans are curiosity-driven creatures and we want answers to questions. So I guess, to put it simply, we would replicate our bodies because we think it's cool. 